Okay, so <clears throat> good morning and thank you. Uh, as uh, Nigel mentioned, there are two papers here, Fast Cut and Choose Based Protocols from Malicious and Converted Adversaries by myself, and Efficient Secure Two-Party Computation Using Symmetric Cut and Choose by uh, Yen Huang, Jonathan Katz, and David Evans. I'm going to give the general intro and talk about my paper, and then Yen will take over and talk about his paper. So we're talking about secure two-party computation, where we have two parties with private inputs, X and Y, and they wish to compute some function of their inputs while preserving certain security properties like privacy, correctness, and independence of inputs. So this is a widely studied topic and uh, actually a very hot topic now, as Ran mentioned last night in the RAMP session. So uh, I think everyone's familiar with the basic concept. There are two main adversary models that have been considered for this problem. The first is semi-honest adversaries. These are adversaries who are rather benign. They follow the protocol specification, but they're just trying to learn more than they're allowed to by inspecting the transcript. So we can get really, really efficient protocols for semi-honest adversaries, in fact, extraordinarily efficient, but it's, quite, it's a rather weak guarantee. There are settings where it makes sense, but there are many, many settings, or the majority of settings, where you'd want something stronger. And for that, you would want security in the presence of malicious adversaries, which means that security is preserved no matter what the adversary does, no matter what attack strategy they run, and this, of course, gives us the security guarantee that we want, but it uh, comes at a much, much larger cost, and that's the focus of this talk, uh, and both of these papers is reducing that cost. So let's just talk, both of these papers uh, look at how to use Yao's basic protocol in order to get malicious security, so we'll just review in 20 seconds or so what the basic idea is. So we have Alice and Bob with respective inputs X and Y, and Alice generates a garbled or encrypted circuit. This is essentially a circuit that uh, can be computed without revealing anything about what's actually inside, what's going on inside. In particular, it doesn't reveal anything about the inputs. And Alice sends that uh, garbled circuit to Bob, and then they do something else in order for Bob to get the information he needs in order to compute the circuit on the inputs X and Y. Bob computes the circuit, learns nothing at all because it was encrypted except for the output. So that's the, secure, that's the uh, YAS protocol for semi-honest adversaries. When we look at malicious adversaries, there, there are a number of problems that arise, but the most fundamental problem is that Alice may not construct the circuit correctly. Now, why is that a concern? Think about, uh, well, firstly, we said that we need correctness. So if we need correctness, then the correct uh, function has to be computed, but if Alice generates a circuit which computes a different function, obviously we won't have correctness. But beyond that, Alice can actually construct a circuit that reveals more about Bob's input than it's supposed to, maybe actually even uh, embeds Bob's entire input in the output. So the fact that the circuit may not be correct actually also breaches privacy. So the solution to this is what's called the cut and choose paradigm, which is uh, loosely described as follows. Instead of Alice constructing one circuit, she actually constructs many, many circuits and sends them all to Bob. Bob then chooses a subset of those circuits and says, I want to check you, Alice, that those, this subset that you sent me is actually all correct. All of these are the correct circuit. She send, and he sends that back to Alice. Uh, Alice uh, opens them he, uh, and they check and then they decide to compute on the, on the rest of the circuits and they take the majority output. Why do they take the majority output? Well, the cut and choose guarantees that the vast majority of the circuits sent by Alice are correct, not necessarily all of them, but if Alice had sent many incorrect circuits, then Bob would have caught Alice. So now Bob knows that the majority of circuits are correct, so he takes the majority output, that way he's sure he's taking the correct output. The main question we have to ask here is what's the cost of this cut and choose? How many circuits do we need in order to make sure that the majority are indeed correct? And this is a simple combinatorical question. And uh, in 2011, uh, with some tight analysis, we got to it's approximately 2 to the minus a third s. It's a little bit less than that. And it turns out that if you want error of 2 to the minus 40, and this is statistical error of 2 to the minus 40, you need about 125 circuits. If you want statistical error of 2 to the minus 80, which is a very, very strong level, you need approximately 250 circuits. But even just looking at uh, 125, this is very, very, very expensive. So if we can do semi-honest security really efficiently, 125, slower, 125 times slower than that is a very heavy price. And the aim of both of these works is simply to reduce the number of circuits from 125 or from, uh, or the, to say, let's say different, to reduce the uh, error from uh, 2 to the minus uh, s over 3 approximately to something which is lower than that. So in my paper, using s circuits alone, plus some additional overhead that I'll describe, 
we, can, we get error down to 2 to the minus s. I won't say it's optimal because I have no proof of that, but this sort of seems like the best you could even dream of. In the paper by Huang, Katz, and Evans, they have S circuits going in each side. So each party constructs S circuits and evaluates S circuits. So overall, they have two S circuits to the minus S error, but the latency is, is similar because they work in parallel. Uh, there are a lot of other issues that arise when you do cut and choose, but the main focus that I'm going to talk about is the, uh, the issue of uh, the, um, the correctness of the circuit, and the other things uh, um, can be dealt with uh, as well, and it's in the paper, and as well as the next talk. So in order to understand my solution, now I'll move over to my solution that was a general background. Uh, I want to talk about why, uh, why we need to take a majority. So I mentioned already that we need to take a majority because only it's, it's only guaranteed the majority of the circuits are correct. However, um, if Bob receives, so, so some of the circuits are correct and some are incorrect, if Bob receives everything the same, then it can assume, he can assume that all the circuits are correct and it's fine. But what happens if Bob receives circuits that are, uh, give, give different outputs? So he chooses half to open, he checks that all fine, and the others he receives to compute, and he gets two different outputs. At this stage, Bob knows that Alice is cheating. And if Bob knows Alice is cheating, he can just abort and say, go to hell, Alice, I'm not playing with you anymore because you're a cheat. And in that case, we don't need to talk about majority, we can just talk about, well, either they're all correct, or they're all the same, and that's fine, or there's something different and Bob will abort. That would, be able, that would actually enable us to reduce the number of circuits significantly. Uh, the problem is that this actually uh, opens the door to a very a significant attack. And think about Alice who sends all the circuits to be correct except for one or a few, and this special circuit that uh, Alice sends that's incorrect says if Bob's input has some property, so the first, if the first bit of Bob's input is zero, then output garbage. And if the first bit of uh, Bob's input is one, then co co compute the correct circuit. Now, this is only one bad circuit. It's only co chosen with probably one half to be checked. So with one, probably one half, this, this circuit becomes the one that's, that's computed. And now Bob gets the circuits, evaluates. And if Bob received two different outputs, okay, so if Bob aborts when it receives different outputs, then if the first bit of um, uh, Bob's input is zero, he's going to abort because he got a number of circuits computing the function, and one outputting garbage. It's different, he knows Alice is cheating, so he aborts. If Bob doesn't abort, that means all the circuits were the same, and uh, now Alice knows that it must be that Bob's input, first bit, input bit was one. So just by the mere fact of Alice aborting or not, of Bob aborting or not, sorry, Alice knows, uh, can completely learn the first bit of Bob's input. So therefore, Bob is actually not allowed to abort even if he knows that Alice is cheating, and he has to take the majority uh, output. So what we want to do is to, to, to circumvent that problem. And we want to make cheating possible only if all the checked circuits are correct and all the evaluated circuits are incorrect. Okay, so this is the only way that, Bob, that Alice could cheat. So she sent a whole lot of circuits, some are correct, some are incorrect, and Bob chooses to open. It turns out that all the ones that were opened were the correct ones and all the ones that were not opened were the incorrect ones. They're the ones that were computed. And if you do this, then by choosing each circuit with probability one half to be open or not, you get two to the minus s error with s circuits. Because there's only one way of choosing the circuits to open and not open that would allow Alice to, to succeed. But how can we do this? We do this by running an additional secure computation after we, we do the, the s circuits, say the 40 circuits on the big circuit that we want to compute. We run an additional small computation, so sort of like a bootstrapping technique, because we run an old protocol, but it's a very small a circuit, and this circuit has the property that if Bob receives two different outputs from two different circuits, and therefore knows that Alice is cheating, what he'll actually do is he'll learn Alice's correct input x. And if Bob learns Alice's correct input x, then he can just compute f of x, y itself. Now correctness is preserved, and Alice doesn't know which case happens. So Alice no longer knows whether or not Bob got all the circuits the same or not the same, because he gets to learn Alice's input x via secret computation, and, and Alice doesn't know whether Bob just got everything the same or he actually learned her input. And this uh, would solve the problem. The question is how you could do such a thing well, we just use a protocol from 2011, our previous protocol using 125 circuits, but the circuit is tiny. The number of non-XOR gates, which were the only thing we pay for, is just equal to the number of bits in Alice's input. So it's a tiny, tiny circuit. And all the input consistency and other things, making sure, for example, that Alice uses her correct input in, 
in this computation. These are dealt with just like in all the other works. And the next talk, Payman is going to show really efficient techniques for doing this. And all of his techniques follow over into our work. In, in our work, in my paper, I didn't try at all to optimize all the other parameters because I wanted the focus to be very clear on the number of circuits. But luckily, Payman did the work of showing how to do it really, really uh, efficiently. And so I'm promoting his talk. So you should stay. Um, <coughs> I won't go into more details. The paper shows exactly how you can do this computation. Uh, and all the details are there. And I, I encourage you to read it and have a look. Um, I just want to say about how much the real cost is. So the special circuit that we do has uh, only the, uh, uh, an, an, an AND gate for every input bit of Alice. And comparing them with previous solutions, they, used, they needed three S circuits to get to the minus S error. As long as the circuit that we're computing is one and a half times the, the size of Alice's input, so it's a tiny circuit, then everything's fine. So if you're talking about, say, the AES circuit, then, or, or so like, if you're talking about 128 bits of input for Alice, then as long as the circuit's bigger than 192, our protocol, my protocol will be much, much quicker. And of course, when you're talking about circuits which are tens of thousands or, or just thousands long, then it's going to be much quicker. And compared with the next work by Huang, Katz, and Evans, as long as it's, uh, the circuit is as three times as long as Alice's input, uh, my protocol will be quicker. Again, in, ter in terms of the work, in terms of the latency, they'll be similar. But if we're running things in parallel, we can do twice the throughput because we only have S circuits for one party rather than for both sides. But in terms of latency, they'll be similar. I'll hand it over now to Yen who to, to uh, um, discuss, uh, present his solution. Thank you. <laughs>